your arena. Thank you, Shekufe. Hi, everybody. Greetings from uh, the Invasion Hub in uh, Helsinki. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you today, even if it's going to be a short pleasure because I will have to run back to the meeting I'm here to attend as soon as I kick out this discussion. But it was really important for me to be here and celebrate this milestone with you all. Uh, I would like to start by saying that, you know, I'm sure we all agree that the Foundation for Lifelong Health, Productivity, Wellbeing is built in the very early years, starting from pregnancy. And these findings from the neuroscience and evidence shared in the 2016 Lancet series have informed what we typically refer to as the nurturing care framework. In layman's term, what it is that a child needs uh, to reach its full potential, these five interrelated and divisible things, good health, adequate nutrition, safety and security, responsive caregiving, and opportunities for learning. So following the launch of the uh, nurturing care framework in 2018, there has been numerous of resources that have been developed to guide its implementation and respond to the demand for supporting advocacy and socializing the concept. We have been on this journey for the past five years, as Shrekufi already mentioned, and today we can celebrate the global launch of two important and long-awaited resources, the Nurturing Care Practice Guide and the Nurturing Care Handbook. Now, the Practice Guide and the Handbook build on already existing resources and they will help us take nurturing care to another level. And it has been developed, both have been developed to help any government, donor, development partner, institution, practitioner, individual who wants to take action to help children survive and thrive. The handbook specifically shows how governments and other stakeholders around the world can put nurturing care in practice. It guides implementation by bringing together all the elements of enabling environments and service provision. And like the framework itself, it is organized around five strategic actions with a separate guide, guide for each of them. Lead and invest, families and communities, service strengthening, progress monitoring, and scale up and innovation. As for the practice guide, it responds to requests from practitioners and country teams who want to understand how to adapt health and nutrition services to be supportive of nurturing care. To be supportive of nurturing care. Uh, sorry, my... Uh, um, to be supportive of nurturing care and also to strengthen uh, caregivers' capacity. Uh, it is intended to be used as a complement to existing guiding packages and instruments and it describes what managers can do to prepare services and better equip providers, including practical suggestions for what they can do as part of their ongoing contacts with families. It is very important to emphasize the fact that while both sets of tools have been developed as global resources, they are not prescriptive or universal, and they will have to be adapted for different uses in respective contexts. So they are not meant they are meant basically to provide guidance on the framework's implementation and will support the holistic development of the child by promoting nurturing care in strong collaboration with all sectors and actors to, de to deliver early childhood development as an outcome for all children. I encourage you to be engaged today and beyond. And if you have any questions, concerns, please feel free to reach out to any member of the Global Nurturing Care Core team which I really like to thank here today for making this event possible and for really reaching this milestone. With that, I will hand over to my colleague in UNICEF's health section, Anne, for an overview of the nurturing care practice guide. And I thank you again for your attention. Over to you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. And hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very excited to introduce you and provide um, a broad overview um, you can go to the next slide, Peter, please, um, of, the, of the content of the new Nurturing Care Practice Guide. Um, this guide was really developed in response to requests that we received from many of you, from our teams and countries, from government partners, from implementing partners, to have more practical guidance and, and some examples, some specific and practical examples on, on what exactly we mean when we keep saying we need to strengthen services to be able to better support nurturing care. So this is our response to that, and we hope that it will be useful to many of you. Um, next slide, please. All right. Um, so 
the services that this guide specifically focuses on are routine health and nutrition services. And the reason for that is that these services really provide already existing opportunities through regular, often scheduled, but also un unscheduled touch points where caregivers and children um, engage with providers throughout pregnancy and early childhood. Um, there are opportunities through creating an inclusive and more family-centered environment in health facilities and by capacitating providers to even better support caregivers in understanding the importance off and acquiring skills to support their children's health and health, healthy development. Um, it is really parents and, and caregivers that are primarily responsible for the care of their children, but all of them require, require some kind of support and encouragement to do so. Then there are others who might have limited capacity or feel insecure. An example for that, for example, are adolescent parents um, single parents, and they might need some more intense support and services, and we touch on those um, in this guide. Next slide. Um, so as Irina said earlier, the nurturing care framework really has um, five components, um, and the existing services are two of the components that we're targeting in the guide, so it's good health and good nutrition. Um, but access, quality, and utilization of these existing services is often not optimal. So one important thing is to make sure um, that really all children have access to good quality, routine health and nutrition services. So that is the component of strengthening services. But then there's an opportunity to add to these services. So um, to strengthen the support for the <laughs> other three essential components of nurturing care, those being responsive caregiving, early learning, safety and security, but also to strengthen support to caregivers whose mental and physical well-being are really essential for them to be even able to provide nurturing care to their children. So the practice guide focuses specifically on, on, on ways to add support for these four elements um, to existing services, responsive caregiving, early learning, safety and security, and support to caregiver well-being. Well Next slide. We don't start from zero in the guide. We really build on skills and intervention that are already introduced in existing foundational training packages for service providers, which were designed for health workers, addressing early learning, responsive caregiving at very varying levels of intensity. You see some here displayed um, on this slide. These um, foundational um, tools and packages are really intended to be used as part of routine health services at facility or the home level for children three years and younger, um, but they have been adapted in many contexts for use in other platforms, such as home visiting by social workers, parenting programs for groups, trainings for early childhood um, educators. So the Nurturing Care Practice Guide itself is not a training package, but it takes many of the skills and interventions from these existing training packages and shows how or where they might fit within existing services along the life course. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the Nurture and Care Practice Guide targets, the target audience are providers and managers of, managers of health and nutrition services. Um, as I said already, it focuses on three of the five interrelated components of nurturing care, as well as on caregiver well-being. It focuses on the universal support and services that really all children should be able to access but it also emphasizes the need for more targeted or indicated support for some children and families. It um, considers, it introduces considerations to um, serve all children and their caregivers, including those children that have chronic illnesses, developmental delays or disabilities. It is also equally relevant and touches on adaptations that might be required in humanitarian and emergency settings. The guide, and I hope you will have a chance to, to take a deeper look after this webinar, many of you might have already, um, has three sections. One is an introductory part on nurturing care, so it gives the rationale for strengthening um, support for these elements that we're introducing, um, and a little bit of that I shared in my introduction. And then the second part um, really targets managers of services, managers of facilities on what they need to do to prepare and enable those health and nutrition services 
um, to reduce barriers, to build skills of providers, to identify resources for additional support. And I'll go a little bit more in detail on that. And the third part really talks about practical examples of what providers can do in existing services. Next slide. All right, so the second part, as I said, it really targets the providers of services um, and, and some examples of what these managers can do. Um, so it talks about what can we do to make faci facilities more accessible and welcoming for all, all children? What are some criteria to make uh, facilities actually inclusive for families and children, including those that might have special needs? It talks about what do we need to do to enable the services to support caregiving. So how can we integrate these additional elements of nurturing care in case management protocols? And that might, for example, mean that we need to um, increase the time intervals that a provider has to engage with a caregiver um, and children to add some additional interventions and engagement. It talks about how do we need to make sure that these uh, additional elements that we integrate in services need to be considered as part of supervision, as part of mentoring and additional support to providers. It talks about what are the kind of capacities of service providers that they need in order to be in the skilled enough um, to support caregivers. Um, and you see this table on the right hand side, it talks about on the one hand side, the basic interpersonal communication skills that providers required will require, which will help them in general to do what they are supposed to do. But it also talks about the specific skills that they really need to support caregiver in improving their practices for nurturing care. It talks about what do we need to do, what do we need to consider um, in, in the context of a humanitarian or health crisis to not forget or neglect core elements of nurturing care. Um, and then it identified some of the needs that providers, uh, that managers can actually help to advocate for and make sure are accessible for those families and children that need some more specialized support. Next slide. So the third part, as I said, is going very specifically targeting the providers of different services. Um, it talks about what it is that providers can do. They can observe interactions between caregivers and their children. They can ask questions and discuss questions and concerns that people have, but they can also introduce certain practices and be a model. Um, and by that, they can support care caregivers to be more responsive, to recognize opportunities that they might have to help their children to learn. They can uh, help them to understand what it means to provide a safe and protective environment, but also to take care of themselves. Um, and you see there are some sort of core practices um, that, that providers can help caregivers to acquire. Next slide, please. And then what the, the third part does, and here's just one example, it really, pulls out specific touch points where providers engage with caregivers and children. So in antenatal care, in the context of well child services, and the example that you see here is in the context of sick child services. And what we do is to look at um, these caregiver practices that I um, mentioned earlier, and what does that specific mean in the context of caring here in this example for a sick child. So a sick child, the most important thing is certainly not that the child sort of plays and learns, but the sick child needs to be nurtured. So what does it mean to feed a sick child, to make sure that the sick child is not left, left alone, that pain is managed, um, and that caregivers have actually the support and environment to provide care for a sick child while they might need help um, with their other duties or other things. So these, these are some very practical and concrete examples um, in, the second, in, in the third part of the guide for these different existing touch points. Next slide. So what's next and what are some ways on how we hope this guide might be useful to you in the context where you are working? So we think there might be opportunities to actually use the guide and convene at country level to review what are we already doing or where are there opportunities to complement? What are some new ideas that the guide introduces that you might not have thought about before? And what we certainly don't expect is that everything that's suggested in this guide should be done at once. But there can be a phased approach. You can look at what are some low hanging fruit of things that we can really change at larger scale. What are some services where there are opportunities? How can we document what we do? How can we learn and how can we scale? 
um, you can discuss across providers and we really hope that it's an opportunity to come together of, as health providers, as nutrition service providers to institutionalize skills building. So are any of the foundational packages that I already mentioned already used in your context? Are there opportunities to integrate some of these elements um, in pre, but also in in-service training and incorporate them in mentoring and supervision efforts? Um, you can use sections of the guide and disseminate them individually. So particularly the, the third part, um, you can pull out these different sections and share the sick child section with providers of IMCI services and the ANCI section, ANC section with providers of antenatal care services, et cetera. And then of course, we are very interested for you to share with us what you do, if the guide is useful, what kind of adaptations or changes we might do, um, and to actually learn from you what you're doing, how you're applying it, how you strengthen these elements in the context of health and nutrition services um, so that we can help other countries to learn from what some of you might be doing. Next slide. So with this, I uh, want to thank all of you, particularly the many, many people um, across the world, really truly, that helped to inform and shape this guide through its many iterations. And I want to give a very special shout out to Jane Lucas. Jane, if you're here, turn on your camera. Um, she's really been the mother <laughs> of this of this guide with all her knowledge and experience that has gone into this. Um, so a special thanks to Jane on behalf of all of us. Um, and with that, I pass it on to Sheila to introduce um, the other uh, new resource, the updated Nurturing Care Handbook. Thanks, Annie. You can go to the next slide. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Sheila Manji. I'll be presenting the handbook today, uh, and I'll put the link in the chat for you uh, so that you can follow along should you wish. I, we have six guides in the Nurturing Care Handbook. The first guide is the Start Hair Guide, and that is where we recommend that you start. Uh, and then the five remaining guides each map onto one of the strategic actions in the Nurturing Care Framework. So the handbook is a set of six guides. Next slide, please. The guide is intended for a variety of users. Uh, it could be policymakers, it could be people from working in training institutions, it could be practitioners. It is very diverse. Uh, in the Start Here guide, you will find a table that maps out prospective audiences for each guide, um, but we do encourage you to look at it from many different perspectives and see how to use it across different audiences. Because we are all at different starting points in each of our contexts, it is difficult to say which order you might look at the guides. We definitely recommend starting with the first one, start here. And then after that, you may find that you move around the different guides, uh, maybe starting with strength and services, moving back to lead and invest, looking at two in parallel. They can be used in any combination and in any order that makes sense for you. Next slide. The handbook builds on these two images that we have in the nurturing care framework and these underpin what we strove to do in the handbook. The first we know that we want to ensure that all children receive nurturing care. So as we thought about the strategic actions and we thought about what actions could be taken, we were trying to think about what needs to happen under each of those strategic strategic actions for the children to receive nurturing care. And then the second is this aspect of enabling environment. So we want to think about what are the caregiver capabilities? What do we need to do to empower communities to ensure the services are supportive and that the policies are enabling? And so you will see that we give attention not just to what's happening at the front line, but to that whole wider ecosystem. Next slide. In the Start Here guide, as you might expect, it's giving you an orientation and an overview uh, to what the handbook as a whole is, um, but it also points you towards some very useful resources or websites that might help you as you think more broadly about the work in your context. Next slide. Now, each of the five guides then, so the ones that map onto the strategic actions of the framework, these each of them break down into three thematic areas. So for example, lead and invest has thematic areas of governance, planning, and financing. And so that pattern is repeated in each of the guides. Uh, if you go on the next slide. 
Next slide, thanks. So here is an example of uh, what you would expect to see in each of them. They follow a very similar structure. The first would be to unpack what, what the strategic action is about and why it is important for us to be uh, addressing this area. Then for each of the thematic areas, you would find suggested actions and a set of common barriers or frequently asked questions. Um, these are things that have come up over and over and over again. And, and so we've tried to compile them in one area and then also provide uh, recommendations of actions that you could take um, to advance or mitigate those issues that are coming up. There are across the guides, various tools, various checklists, various links to articles, uh, websites that would be of use and various case studies as well, showing how some of these actions have been taken forward in different contexts. Each of the guides concludes with a section on signs for monitoring progress, which gives you an indication or a way to reflect on how are you doing um, in a particular area and gives you a sense of something you might want to focus on going forward. Next slide. So if we take, for example, Lead and Invest, Lead and Invest has three thematic areas, governance, planning, and financing. And this from the governance section are examples of the frequently asked questions that are addressed, as well as the steps that have been shown to be effective, so the suggested actions. And the idea is that you would identify where you wanted to focus, so which strategic action you wanted to focus on, then within that, which thematic area you wanted to focus on, and then within that, which steps you wanted to focus on. Um, depending on where you are and what your needs are, you may find that all the steps are relevant, or you may find that only some of them are relevant. And so the idea is to provide you with a menu of options that you can choose and adapt based on your context. It is not prescriptive, and it is not necessarily meant to be used in a sequential manner. So again, it goes back to what is the starting point in your context and where are the areas that you want to focus on? Next slide, please. So this is an example of the signs of progress that you can find at the end of the Strategic Action One Guide, Lead and Invest. So a few kind of markers to help you identify, am I making progress in this area? So is there a national coordination mechanism? Is it in place? Is it functioning? Are there champions? From nurturing, for nurturing care across different sectors? Uh, do we have a national roadmap or strategy? Do we have sector-specific plans that are costed? Uh, and is there government spending and is it equitable? Next slide. And then as I mentioned, in each of the guides, you will find various boxes and these boxes highlight different tools or resources that could be useful. So in the Lead and Invest, you will find uh, information about the Nurturing Care Advocacy Toolkit or the Countdown to 2030 Country Profiles for Early Childhood Development. And then there are various case studies. Some of these are a specific example from a specific country. Some of them might be initiatives or some of them might be uh, areas of work that could help inspire action. Next, please. So the take home message is that the handbook is meant to be a resource that can support reflection, that can support planning, action. Uh, and because we are all at different starting points, we have to work from where we are at. So we don't necessarily expect you to use the guide, um, starting with lead and invest and moving sequentially through. You may find that if you're part of a technical working group or a multi-sectoral group, or even within your own organization, you want to focus on a particular strategic action. And then you would deep dive there and use that as a, a way to inform or reflect on where you are at and where you want to go next. Uh, and because we are so many, as Shikofi alluded to in the beginning, we are a collective of many, many different organizations, many different sectors, many different constituency groups. And so each of us would find a different way and a different home and a different place to land in the handbook. Uh, and as long as we are each finding a piece to move forward, we can see some progress in those areas. Uh, next slide, please. So lastly, I'd like to close by acknowledging the contribution of numerous individuals and organization to the creation of this handbook. Uh, the handbook was uh, developed uh, by the World Health Organization in, but benefited from many, many, many inputs from over 20 organizations and institutions. We also held an online consultation of the draft version of this handbook in 2021, uh, and over 100 individuals contributed uh, and helped us to further refine the handbook and prepare it for its release today. 
we would like to give special thanks to Mark Tomlinson, Kelly Jemmel of the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, and Bettina Schwethelm, an independent consultant who were members of the core writing team. And we'd also like to acknowledge the Conrad and Hilton Foundation, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, and the King Baudouin Foundation of the USA for making the development of this handbook possible. Next slide, please. So we encourage you to look at the Nurturing Care website, the ECDAN website for more information, more resources. We will absolutely share all the links um, for you in the chat, but also as well afterwards in the post webinar email. And if you do have questions about these resources, please do feel free to put them in the chat. We'll start collecting them now. But I'm going to hand over to Boniface uh, from UNICEF to lead us through the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila, um, and thanks you all for, for joining. Um, you have heard from Annie giving us an overview of the handbook, and also Sheila has given us an overview. Um, now we want to move to have a discussion, and we are honored that we have you know, four distinguished colleagues who are going to help us in this session. Um, it's now taking to say we have heard these are the documents, but in practice, how is it going to look like? So allow me to invite Dr. Caroline Mwangi, uh, she is the head um, of neonatal and child health in the Ministry of Health in Kenya. And also allow me to welcome Dr. Oka Kwame. He is the director of the National Nutrition Program in the Ministry of Health, Public Hygiene and Universal Health Coverage in Ivory Coast. And I also have the pleasure to introduce uh, Meran Picoro. Uh, she's the maternal, newborn and child health and nutrition program manager for PATH in Mozambique. And we also have Dr. Rajesh Mahita. Uh, he's the consultant at WHO and the former regional advisor at WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. Uh, thank you uh, all for creating this time that you can be part of this conversation. So allow me to pose the first question to Dr. Caroline Mwangi. Uh, Dr. Mwangi, how can the, the ministers of health use the practice guide to strengthen the capacities of the workforce and improve the service delivery? We have heard but how can now the Minister of Health you know, respond and use this package in practice? Over to you, Dr. Caroline. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Uh, thank you to the team for a great introduction to, to the practice guide and the handbook. So I was invited to give my perspective on how the ministries of health can strengthen capacities of the workforce and utilize this uh, practice guide. So as we've had countries uh, need to review the, the practice guide and the handbook and adapt to uh, their local uh, standards to, to adapt them to be uh, in, to fit their local practices and guidelines. So I think the first way would be to uh, sort of integrate this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this suggestions that have been given in the guide uh, the practices, uh, because the emphasis is on how the healthcare provider uh, can identify and can 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 observe caregivers when they come uh, to the health uh, facility, and there's mention of both uh, the inpatient and the outpatient, and also along the continuum of life, all the way from the antenatal period, postnatal, to the well child, and indeed to the child who's sick, both at outpatient and uh, inpatient level. So the first thing would be to integrate some of these checks uh, into our policies and guidelines and uh, training uh, manuals for our healthcare providers. Uh, the next would be to this, this implementation of uh, these guidelines and facilitating our healthcare providers would require resource, resources and uh, allocation of resources uh, to facilitate this, uh, investing in uh, spaces for children, investing in uh, safe spaces, the play boxes that have been mentioned at all levels of care, from starting from the, uh, the primary healthcare facilities, for instance, in, in our country, all the way to uh, the inpatient facilities. Are they child-friendly? Are they encouraging uh, the, the child who's, being, who's come into the health facility uh, the three fo the, the focus, the three uh, aspects, the responsive caregiving, 
uh, is the environment safe for the child in the health facility? So such things would require uh, adequate resource allocation. And one of the ways, this is one of the ways the ministries of health can support this. Another way is uh, having skill, a skilled health workforce, both in the right uh, density distributed adequately, in the right quantity, and also with the right skill set. So we do know that, uh, and the handbook, the, the guide has mentioned that there is a specific training for healthcare workers, the care for child development. So for those who have undergone this training, this guide would act as just a reminder and um, just uh, to affirm and, and, and also sustain the knowledge and the skills that they've learned. But for those who've not been trained, it would be an opportunity to introduce uh, this concept of uh, nurturing care into our integrating it into our health uh, when we when we attend to our sick children and even indeed to the mothers during pregnancy. Uh, another way, so another way would be also investing in uh, training uh, and also integrating this uh, into pre-service into the pre-service uh, curriculum would also be one of the ways that a ministry can increase the capacity. And even having this guide, uh, snippets of it or part of it introduced at pre-service level and having students uh, go through it across all the cadres. So we're talking about a whole health systems uh, strengthening approach. Uh, another one would be um, ensuring that um, the commodities supporting uh, health facilities, indeed the managers, because they're the ones that would address the immediate uh, environment for to, that would enable the healthcare provider to attend to, uh, to, to, to att when, when attending to these children and indeed the pregnant mothers and even the family as a whole, uh, to, to adequately offer, to offer resources that are, um, that indeed will uh, benefit, will, will actually provide an environment that uh, this healthcare worker can assess a child, can assess a caregiver and their interaction with the child and offer uh, advice and counseling as needed on the components of nurturing care. So uh, another way that uh, we can increase this is uh, for us, for the use of uh, maybe the community health uh, uh, volunteers in our country or community health workforce, uh, when we capacity, when we increase the capa their capacity to to actually support caregivers at household level, so one way would be increasing the capacity of the community health care workers, and that's through training them on care for child development, uh, supporting them to go to homesteads uh, to. Uh, see how caregivers interact with the child in a home environment, especially a well child, and also counsel the caregiver on ways that they can, um, they can, they can provide an optimum environment. We've also been told about um, the offering nurturing care, uh, especially to those children who are in need, the ones with special uh, needs, the ones with disabilities, the ones with, uh, with HIV and emergency settings. So a minister, the Ministry of Health should uh, integrate and consider, take this into consideration when uh, developing our policies and guidelines for dissemination and when interacting with uh, our health care providers and indeed uh, facility care managers to be able to, to advocate that um, the, the, the adequate resources and indeed a whole health system strengthening approach is used so that uh, we can facilitate uh, healthcare providers to uh, give uh, or provide an optimum environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mank. And to all of us, feel free to continue posting your questions in the chat. And if you also have you know, suggestions on how you're going to implement the two products in your country context, feel free to continue doing that. Uh, with that, let me move to Dr. Kwame. Dr. Kwame, how can the ministries of health and specifically uh, those you know, for maternal, newborn and child health and nutrition programs use the practice guide to strengthen the capacities of you know, workforce and also service delivery? Um, over to you. Merci. 
Euh, alors, je, je voudrais donc euh, commencer par dire merci et dire que nous sommes heureux de participer à cette réunion euh, pour partager donc euh, les opportunités euh, que nous disposons pour l'utilisation des guides donc, pratiques euh, pour les soins attentifs. Il faut... Euh, alors, nous avons l'occasion euh, aujourd'hui de bâtir sur notre expérience. Euh, en effet, euh, depuis 2017, la Côte d'Ivoire participe à la réflexion euh, et à la mise en œuvre euh, des soins attentifs pour le développement de la petite enfance. Marquant ainsi donc euh, son engagement qui se traduit dans ses orientations stratégiques qui figurent dans son plan euh, national de développement pour la période 2021-2025. Cette priorité est, est définie dans l'effet 2 de ce document, à savoir que les populations, notamment les femmes, les enfants et les personnes à besoins particuliers, accèdent à des services de qualité et adoptent des pratiques favorables à la nutrition et au développement de la petite enfance. Cette priorité euh, est déclinée en plan donc, opérationnel sur les cinq prochaines années euh, qui vise donc, au passage à échelle de l'intégration des soins attentifs dans le paquet de nutrition ouvert dans les centres de santé. Également, la mise en, en œuvre d'interventions communautaires à travers la stratégie de convergence portant sur les foyers de renforcement des activités de nutrition au niveau communautaire, donc qui délivre des soins de nutrition communautaire et un paquet de soins attentifs pour le développement de la petite enfance. Nous bâtissons également euh, sur notre expérience à la mise en œuvre de, de projets communautaires d'intervention de nutrition et de développement de la petite enfance. Aussi, euh, la Côte d'Ivoire participe au, au programme Global Scope for Early Development pour développer et étudier une nouvelle échelle universelle pour le développement de la petite enfance pour les enfants de 0 à 3 ans, qui se déroule actuellement donc dans une commune d'Abidjan. Toute cette expérience a bénéficié de plusieurs financements, dont un investissement de l'État de Côte d'Ivoire à travers donc, un prêt de la Banque mondiale, Bénéficions également de l'appui de l'UNICEF, de Power Nutrition et de la Fondation Jacob. Alors, nous avons des opportunités énormes pour l'utilisation de ce guide. Aujourd'hui, nous passons à échelle sur les interventions de nutrition, aussi bien au niveau des structures de santé et également au niveau des communautés, à travers les soins mère kangourou, à travers l'initiative structure sanitaire Amis des bébés à travers donc le suivi promotion de la croissance, la vaccination, la nutrition de l'adolescence, la nutrition de la femme enceinte, de la femme allaitante. Toutes ces occasions donc, et portes d'entrée du système de santé seront euh, mises à, à contribution. Nous avons également euh, l'occasion pour utiliser ce guide-là euh, au niveau de l'organisation des services de santé pour le renforcement des capacités du personnel de santé afin de répondre aux besoins des enfants. Nous, avons, nous entamons également euh, la réflexion sur la santé mentale et le soutien psychologique des enfants et adolescentes en Côte d'Ivoire euh, sous l'initiative de notre programme national de santé mentale. Autant d'opportunités qui nous permettent de nous projeter sur les priorités pour 2023-2024 il s'agit pour nous donc, de, à partir de ces guides et qui tombent à point nommé, de procéder à l'intégration des messages sur le développement euh, à, dans tous les matériels euh, de nutrition. Nous, avons également, euh, un, pré, nous prévoyons également d'intégrer les messages et des activités spécifiques donc, dans tous les matériels clés du développement de la petite enfance. Nous procédons également euh, au renforcement des capacités du personnel de santé euh, sur l'ensemble du territoire, de l'ensemble des centres de santé. Nous avons également, euh, nous prévoyons aussi l'intégration des soins attentifs dans les conseils individuels 
au port d'Antrus, cité plus haut. Également, euh, nous préparons la révision des curriculaires de formation euh, pour la formation des travailleurs sociaux. C'est une occasion pour nous de prendre en compte ces nouvelles orientations de, euh, que nous offre le guide. Il y a également euh, la révision de notre protocole de prise en charge de la maintenance aiguë qui va prendre en compte les soins attentifs. Et puis, nous avons l'opportunité à travers donc, ces guides d'avoir de, de euh, une bonne clarté sur le suivi des interventions, sur les soins attentifs. Et enfin, nous souhaitons donc euh, participer à la génération d'évidences pour renforcer l'offre de services au niveau donc, de, de l'ensemble des structures de santé. Je voudrais terminer en disant que nous avons également l'opportunité d'avoir de, de, des documents qui nous permettent de, de poursuivre euh, notre offre de services dans la convergence et dans la complémentarité des services euh, que nous offre donc aujourd'hui euh, notre, notre stratégie au niveau communautaire. Voilà donc présenté autant d'opportunités que nous avons et que nous aurons à partir de l'orientation que nous avons euh, à partir de ces guides. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwame. Um, we have heard from the two governments, from Kenya and also Ivory Coast, but allow me to transition to path. So, Meralyn, um, we have seen and some of the people you know, on, this, in this, on this call can testify of the good works you know, that are happening uh, in Mozambique. So, CAT path has been strengthening the workforce uh, capacity to promote nurturing care for the past 10 years. But now, in what ways does the practice guide help address the gaps and also advance efforts to strengthen the healthcare, I mean, healthcare uh, workforce? So how is the practice guide going to help, you know, to close the gaps and advance, you know, the, the efforts to strengthen the workforce? Over to you, Mirani. Thank you so much, uh, Boniface. Um, I think what's great about the practice guide uh, is that it targets two important types of stakeholders within health systems frontline service providers and managers. Uh, what PATH has learned over a decade uh, of integrating nurturing care in health systems is that even if you train, mentor, and supervise service providers to deliver nurturing care interventions, they will not perform the additional tasks unless managers provide an enabling environment in which to do them. Section two of the practice guide specifically offers recommendations and practice practical tools for managers to consider and use as they prepare to make health and nutrition services more nurturing. Um, if you take, for example, the, the checklist um, to create inclusive, accessible, and welcoming health families, health facilities presented in box three on page 19, now I'm referring to the guide specifically. Uh, this is actually a simple tool that managers can use to ensure that more caregiver and child-friendly services are provided. And many times it doesn't take a lot of added efforts or cost um, to introduce specific um, interventions or settings within health facilities that make them more nurturing. Another important consideration for managers that the practice guide provides and that reflects the day-to-day -day reality of health systems, particularly in facility settings, is the high turnover of service providers. Now, integrating responsive caregiving, early learning, safety and security, and uh, caregiver well-being in child health and nutrition services takes provided behavior change. We're talking about shifting how they've been working, uh, focusing on health and nutrition interventions, and now adding components of nurturing care that um, perhaps were touched on during pre-service training, but were never really strengthened during service delivery. And uh, training, mentorship, supportive supervision, and appropriate motivation of inputs are important, but it takes time to change behaviors. And that is true with service providers too. So it is critical that health systems identify strategies to minimize losses in skilled personnel. And the guide lists some of the key strategies that can be, that can be put in place. So I think that's a really important thing for, for managers to be looking at um, as they integrate uh, other components of the nurturing care framework in existing health and nutrition uh, services. Now, section three looks at what frontline providers supported by their managers 
can do to integrate responsive caregiving, early learning, safety and security, and caregiver well-being at different maternal child health and nutrition contact points. In organizing it by contact point, the guide provides tailored content, most appropriate for specific service providers, and it provides tools they can use to promote optimal caregiving behaviors at each of those contact points. Each contact point offers a unique, unique opportunity to strengthen these optimal caregiving behaviors. And the more contacts you leverage, the more you reinforce the messages. However, given the complexity of health systems and in countries like Mozambique, the resource constraints they face, one may need to select the contact points most feasible to leverage in one specific context. That's why I think it's such a useful tool. Like Annie said, you don't have to do it all at once, but you can select which ones you want to start from. After a decade of learning how to integrate nurturing care in health systems, what I can say is that this is still a learning process. The small strategies for incremental wins that needs to be put in place and that offer the best return for investment in specific contexts required continued evidence generation. As practitioners, managers, and different actors in development and humanitarian content, context plan how to integrate nurturing care in health and nutrition contexts, using this guide as a starting point, I'd encourage them to systematically document what works and what doesn't, and how much it actually costs to integrate nurturing care and health systems in different contexts. While we celebrate the launch of this guide that summarizes so much of what we have learned to date, um, I have no doubt that it will benefit from all the, all the evidence to be generated by those present in this webinar in any future iterations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Merani, for the insights. Allow me to, to, to move on and to go to Dr. Rajesh. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, how might the handbook be used as a tool to facilitate reflection, also planning and action to advance nurturing care at national and subnational level? So from your experience working at national and subnational level, how is the handbook you know, going to look like in practice? Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Boniface. And thanks for colleagues uh, who have already introduced uh, the guide itself, uh, the handbook and the practice guide. Uh, and thanks to Sheila who gave the overview of uh, the, uh, the handbook. So, so allow me to actually uh, share you share with you a story from our southeast asia region of who or where we have actually uh, used this handbook uh, effectively already so that will illustrate the uh, practical application of uh, this particular tool uh, which is part of the nurturing care framework and nurturing care repository uh, of uh, tools so, so we have a history of ECD uh, early childhood development among our member states. 2010, uh, 29, we had a first regional meeting on uh, early childhood development in the Southeast Asia region. And we took stock of what countries are doing and we found that uh, there was a lot of emphasis on early child education, uh, but that was largely focused on uh, later years of life, uh, that is starting three years uh, or maybe sometime a little later. Uh, and uh, in terms of health and nutrition, just the traditional health and nutrition services uh, were being provided. Uh, not much uh, attention to the responsive care uh, or early learning opportunities. Uh, so that was 2010 that the regional office came out with a strategy for ECD to define the role of health sector. But exciting thing happened in 2018 when this nurturing care framework was launched. And it brought the several concepts together and one could visualize that how will it look like uh, uh, to provide uh, a, a package of interventions that can help uh, children thrive uh, beyond survival. Uh, although I strongly believe that the interventions of nurturing care also improve survival. Uh, but in any case, survive, thrive and transform. Uh, so we, we, this is, was an exciting breakthrough that the nurturing care framework could define several concepts and bring them together. So 2019, uh, we thought in the regions, let's do a, an assessment again, uh, how countries are uh, implementing the five components of nurturing care, if at all, 
or else uh, how much is the preparedness at national level uh, uh, across different sectors to implement at scale uh, the five components of nurturing care. And, and we found grossly that uh, the countries are doing a lot of stuff, uh, but in a very fragmented manner. So several sectoral you know, interventions and services were there, uh, but it was very difficult to see whether all these services are reaching uh, one, one family who needs it, one child who needs all these services, because some of the services were delivered for some children, some services were delivered for other children. So, so we found there is a lot of fragmentation, uh, but in any case, health and nutrition services were kind of the, the, the leading services uh, for, the, for the age group conception to three years, uh, which is the focus of nurturing care. Uh, but you know, when this uh, handbook was being drafted, uh, it gave us that lead that, can we analyze the findings of this assessment using these five strategic uh, actions described in the Nurturing Care Handbook. And that was clearly found an excellent tool that we could clearly demarcate that there are gaps in the lead and investment uh, component, the strategic action area one. Uh, there were poor intersectoral coordination, uh, although the mechanisms were intended, but very difficult to realize in practice. So policy coherence was a problem. There were multiple policies and uh, with overlapping mandates. And the budgets were inadequate. This is all reported by countries through, through document review and through key people interviews. And when we anal analyze the strategy area two, the families and communities uh, engagement, uh, we found the community platforms are ready. People are using the countries, all countries are using community health workers to deliver services. But very poor engagement in terms of nurturing care uh, uh, with the parents and families. Uh, with NGOs and CSOs, uh, the, the, the civil service organizations, and, and private sector particularly. The services part, as I mentioned, health and nutrition services are the forerunners, and they were the strongest services. But the component of responsive care, safety, security, and early learning was very limited in, in, in most of these countries. There are a couple of bright examples from the region which already had embedded some of this. But in practice, uh, the scale and quality was not, uh, not uh, reported as great. Monitoring evaluation, again, some indicators related to responsive care, safety and security, early learning, uh, which are also included in the countdown country profiles. Uh, so many countries you will see from this region uh, have uh, no data on, on the indicators related to these three components of nurturing care. Uh, and uh, very little research, uh, local, uh, you know, research and evidence. Uh, so, so, so it was. Uh, we found that this this, this handbook is pretty good uh, to do a situation analysis uh, of a country uh, towards uh, uh, the planning and implementation of uh, nurturing care programs. So we had a regional meeting based on this assessment in April 2021. So that's about. 12 years later, uh, after 2009 meeting. And this time, then we oriented them to strategic actions. The member states were there, and we had invited health and education and other sectors all together. And many countries uh, uh, nominated delegations to, 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 to come and learn. So, so we worked with them. We, we demonstrated um, uh, any uh, Jen were there from UNICEF, uh, Sheila and uh, Bernadette from WHO headquarters, other partners, Shekufe was there. So, so we had uh, exposed our stakeholders, the member state organizations, the academia, the professional associations. And looking at that, the member states were very clearly able to, to recommend based on each strategic action area that what could be the way forward, what could be clear actions. So we have a list of those recommendations, like they would want to review and strengthen the laws and policies. They would want to do a leadership strengthening and governance mechanism with adequate financing. Uh, and also, you know, uh, set up some intersectoral committees, uh, especially at local level. So there is a clear emphasis on subnational level uh, that uh, we should have uh, those, those mechanisms, not, at, not just at the top, but subnational and local administrative levels like municipalities and the local village uh, headman or head, the committee at the village level to, to that great detail. Uh, and uh, of course, for families and communities, uh, they realized that uh, we should do more. 
in, in fact, they, they decided that the country should actually prepare a communication strategy for ECD uh, to, to improve the community awareness uh, and participation in the programs uh, for nurturing care, uh, largely focusing at the demand for services and also strengthening the home care practices. So a so lot of communication uh, activities were ident have been identified. So, so my sense is that this is all because of the better understanding using this tool uh, that countries were able to decide for existing services to make them more nurturing under strategic action three. So clearly they have said, we will pay more attention to responsive caregiving, early learning, security and safety, and very importantly, perinatal mental health. So, so the care for caregivers, uh, which, which has been a missing point, uh, was clearly identified because we used the strategic action three, uh, the, the guidelines which are there in the handbook. And the countries also decided to do the progressive service model uh, by you know, adopting universal uh, services, targeted services, and indicated services for children and families affected by uh, issues related to delayed or uh, deviated uh, development. Uh, and importantly, uh, paying attention to quality of services across different sectors, uh, the countries actually made a recommendation uh, for WHO to support uh, countries to set up uh, national standards for services. So, so that's clear that while health, quality, health services, quality of care is receiving a lot of attention, <clears throat> can we also prepare something for nutrition, uh, education, and other uh, social support services uh, so that there is a good quality of services in addition to the coverage and equity getting uh, you know scaled up. So also capacity building, we heard uh, from other countries that in-service and pre-service education, so that's another great recommendation. So monitoring evaluation, the countries have agreed to administer ECD index with support of partners and also start collecting the missing data, which I mentioned uh, at the moment, uh, there are weak areas of uh, monitoring. Uh, so they would prefer to integrate in national information systems, uh, especially at subnational level. The data originates from there, and there should be analysis at that level also and take actions to improvement. <clears throat> so similarly, they have said that we will like to invest in uh, research and documentation and especially using uh, digital platforms as solutions because the COVID pandemic did uh, bring up this possibility that digital platforms can be used for capacity building as well as service delivery. So my message, uh, the end line message of this story is that uh, this uh, nurturing care handbook actually can be used to set up a, ba a baseline assessment across sectors uh, for the five components of nurturing care. So, so I would recommend that countries should actually do the first step as a baseline assessment. Uh, and there are tools available to do that. Uh, the one which we used in the regional office, but there are others also. And uh, then uh, I would recommend after this baseline assessment report in hand, the countries should call for a multi-stakeholder consultation uh, and develop uh, working recommendations across the five strategic action area, because the concept has gone deep now that we have to link actions in all the five strategic areas at once, uh, because all five areas are important for a program purpose. And in the end, they would end up doing a national strategic plan uh, and also prepare a subnational implementation plan in the next phase uh, with learning cycles and scaling up uh, a cyclical approach to scale up. So, so, so there is a strong use of handbook in all this planning process, implementation and monitoring the implementation so that the implementation is effective. So I stop here for any further questions or clarifications. Uh, over to you, Boniface. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh. And uh, colleagues, we are going to move on to have a session of question and answers. But I just want to highlight a few things that came out of this conversation. All the speakers touched that we need a strong policy environment. So policies to anchor all these you know, uh, products and also enhancing coordination, the strong workforce, and ensuring that we are also you know, covering all the five components of the nurturing care framework, including also caregiver mental health and well-being. With that, allow me to pass the mic to Chekufe for the next session. Over to you. Thank you so much, Boniface. I'm wondering if all the panelists and the speakers can turn on their videos. That would be wonderful.
So colleagues, as I'm waiting for panelists to turn on their videos, we've had a lot of um, questions come in the chat. Um, and so we'll begin with some of those. And as we begin with that, um, I will, uh, you can you can continue asking questions uh, and also raise your hand. It would be also wonderful to hear from you live. Um, and when you do speak, it would be good if you just kept your questions brief, introduce yourself and where you're calling in from. So just to begin really briefly, um, just to kick us off, maybe, maybe we can just start with a clarifying question that we got from Tomomi Kitamura um, about the difference between or how to use the handbook and the practice guide. And maybe I'll turn it to Sheila and Anne to answer this question. Um, he says that uh, they believe the practice guide is more to guide and navigate us on the practical actions to strengthen services and the and actions with the while the handbook works more as a reference document. Is that a fair description, or would you provide a little bit more detail about when to use each? Um, so Anne and then Sheila. Okay, so I speak about the practice guide, which is to divide our roles. Um, I, you're right, Tomomi. The practice guide uh, focuses on one of the strategic actions, which is strengthening services. And this, it is particularly targeting the managers and providers and those partners that support the implementation of these services. So it is meant to be very practical with ideas of things that can be done right away and ideas that might some more strategic thinking, for example, you know, aspects around pre-service training, et cetera. Sheila, over to you. Thanks, Anne. And so, so while the practice guide is very much aligned with strength and services, strategic action three, and it's very much a tool to be used in services. The handbook is more at a higher level. You could think of it as a reference document, but I think Rajesh, the way you described it as it can help you assess needs in a country, it can help you um, determine or undertake a situation analysis and plan uh, defining what we need to do next. Because if we think about ensuring nurturing care, when you remember when I was presenting, uh, I talked about two figures and the second figure were those green concentric circles, the enabling conditions for children to receive nurturing care. So the handbook, the five strategic actions in that handbook are then looking at what do we need to do in each of those areas to help us put together a, a composite picture of what can be in place to support children. So it may be that in a particular context, things are moving when it comes to lead and invest, but, and so policies are in place and maybe the services are getting better, but maybe we don't have the data that we need um, or we're not using that data. So then you might focus in on strategic action four and look more closely at monitor progress and, and think about what are actions that you need to take to strengthen that area of work. Um, so it would be predominantly not used at the service delivery level, but more for the level of those that are involved in planning and designing policy development um, interventions uh, more at that level. But the, the bottom line is if we're not working systematically across all five strategic actions, we fall short, right? So if we want to see children surviving and thriving, we need to be looking at the five strategic actions. And then within that, looking at how do we strengthen the services better using tools like the practice guide. Wonderful, thanks, Sheila. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be you know looking at the chat, looking at the questions we already have. So bear with me. I want to turn it over to um, Dr. Kwame. If you can answer this question, we have a question from um, from Mark uh, Aguirre, and he's asking: Is there a plan? Uh, are there tools? Uh, you know, especially uh, you know, given that you sit with the with the uh, with the National Nutrition Program, in your context, are there tools uh, that target parents, families, and communities with community nutrition services as the gateway, specifically looking at community nutrition services? Dr. Kwame, are you able to respond? Oui, oui. Oui, effectivement, nous disposons de, de plusieurs outils ou supports pour le renforcement des capacités des prestataires, aussi bien au niveau des structures de santé, mais également au niveau communautaire. Nous développons aujourd'hui une stratégie de convergence à travers donc les foyers de renforcement de la nutrition au niveau communautaire, 
qui euh, développe des soins de nutrition, des actions essentielles de nutrition pour les, pour les mères et les enfants. Et à cela, nous avons intégré le paquet de soins attentifs, euh, donc qui porte sur la stimulation, qui porte sur, euh, sur un ensemble d'offres de services, donc au niveau communautaire, à travers l'éveil. Et, et, et cela prend en compte l'accompagnement des parents euh, sur l'éveil et les, les soins attentifs. Donc, nous avons des boîtes à images, vous avez également des documents des référents de formation, des documents de formation des prestataires, des documents, euh, des guides. Et, et donc, euh, nous avons une très bonne structuration de l'offre. Aujourd'hui, je crois que l'opportunité que nous avons d'avoir ces, ces guides nous permet de revisiter euh, la structuration de l'offre de soins attentifs. Et c'est tout l'intérêt pour nous. Euh, donc, euh, je crois qu'au niveau stratégique, déjà, le fait d'avoir adopté euh, donc les soins entrés dans les services. Euh, Aujourd'hui, nous sommes en train de descendre pour que, au niveau donc, de toutes les portes d'entrée, on puisse disséminer l'ensemble du paquet. Et on va regarder au niveau clinique, on va regarder au niveau communautaire. Et, et donc, pour nous, c'est une petite évaluation qui va nous permettre de réviser, éventuellement de réviser euh, les outils et les documents que nous avons. Voilà comment ce que je peux dire sur la question. Merci. Thank you so much. Um, okay, the next question, uh, Melanie, um, if you can respond, we have um, a workforce question. I'm just, I think I've lost my place in it. Um, uh, sorry, this new format is quite complicated. Um, <laughs> all right, um, here we go. Uh, so from a workforce capacity building perspective, we're actually getting a lot of questions. Um, so can you, can you, do you have any reflections about integration of healthcare and early learning systems in, in, for example, the education sector workforce at all in terms of capacity building for work to three um, in support for caregivers? Well, um, there are a few packages that uh, Pat has provided support uh, in adapting for different sectors, building from, for example, integrated nutrition and early childhood development um, uh, services that are provided, for example, in community health, that, that's a community settings through health services, um, and also adapted, for example, for the social action sector. For the education sector in particular, um, we've been working through multi-sectoral coordination mechanisms to um, assist different sectors in identifying the different interventions they can do uh, through their sectors to support uh, optimal caregiving behaviors. Um, and so in those, through those interactions, a few activities that uh, come to mind, for example, include um, training uh, child care providers uh, in like preschool settings, for example, um, to provide uh, parental uh, parental education, for example, uh, if those are if there are specific parent groups coming together to discuss uh, their their children um, uh, their children performance, and also taking that as an opportunity also to provide parental parental guidance. Um, also teaching, uh, training um, the animators or preschool um, educators to provide services for children with special needs uh, so that they uh, understand the different stages of development, the different needs, and can kind of tailor um, the activities, the play activities um, to the different needs of children. I hope that that helps answer. Um, Thanks, Melanie. No, really helpful. Um, and Dr. Rajesh, can can we turn to you now? Um, we have a really good question. This has come up uh, several times in the chat, and then I'm going to turn over to some of the folks that have their hands raised. Um, do you? How easily can this? You know, these pathways, these guides, be adapted for um, other sectors? Uh, the question is, how easily can it be uh, taken up or adapted used by other sectors, or do you recommend a, uh, a health systems approach for, for early childhood, and is that what the focus is? So I think the main question is, 
you know, what what is the future looking like in terms of addressing other sectors or um, or is it limited to the health sector at this time? <clears throat> So, you know, uh, there is a clear admission right up front when nurturing care framework itself was laid down that it is a multi-sectoral action. Uh, so clearly uh, when we define what can happen at what age uh, of that age band, which we are trying to focus, uh, it could so happen that a sector, particular sector is able to take the lead. Uh, and other sectors then follow, not just follow, but contribute in a complementary manner. But countries can actually use uh, different uh, uh, approaches. They could do a, a, a multi-sectoral action uh, with a lot of intersectoral coordination, keeping one sector in lead and others to follow. Uh, but we have traditionally found that from conception to three years, the most uh, common services uh, which come in contact of families of these children are the health services. Uh, so, and the nutrition services, which in many countries are integrated, embedded with health, or are delivered together in many instances. Uh, while the other, uh, you know, are providing some bit of referral support through social uh, and welfare systems uh, of that sector, or, uh, you know, uh, or at three years of age, when the children are ready for pre formal education, so to preschool and play and all that, then migration of the lead happens, but countries can adopt any of these. But the beauty of this um, strategic actions, five actions, actually continues to define that these actions are important and can be taken, should mm. be taken across all relevant sectors. So it's not that it, the, the actions are relevant only to health, the actions are relevant to all sectors, uh, but okay. when you do the service delivery, first three years traditionally would fall there, but uh, without, you know, without losing the sight that a lot of sectors will come in if there is a child and family who needs more uh, in that age group also. So, but countries that are at liberty to make it work anyway, over. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. And I have one question for Carolyn that's come up in the chat. If you can share from your point of view, um, you know, it, from a workforce development, from the Ministry of Health point of view, I mean, how do you get providers or different aspects in the different um, parts of the service, Stanley asked, how do you get them to offer the five components that have been covered here? Uh, sorry, as part of the question. Yeah, the, the question is, how, what's, um, what's the strategy to get different providers within the healthcare system to offer the five components that have been covered here, the nurturing care components, and to provide that. Like, what's your perspective from the Ministry of Health? Um, the question specifically is in terms of training. How do you get providers to offer the five components? Okay, so the first strategy would be because the training all healthcare providers is quite uh, resource intensive, possibly mm -hmm. con engaging in continuous uh, sensitization of the through various platforms like uh, we have our associations various professional associations having continuous uh, medical education uh, seminars uh, through hospital similar cmes just sensitizing them would be a great first step and then where resources allow actually taking them through uh, the care for child development uh, training but a sensitization on the importance you know once you 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 you're sensitized on why is it important to ensure that all these components are pro are there and what is the effect of providing also uh, as i said ensuring that workforce density sometimes uh, healthcare providers are so so busy they're overwhelmed with patients and the amount of time it would take for them to say observe caregiving practices, observe uh, child uh, caregiver interactions and cancel on the five components of nurturing care. So as managers, maybe providing uh, environments that would enable uh, the, the healthcare providers to have more time, having uh, recruiting more healthcare uh, workers, and that goes to uh, resource allocation. So that's one of the ways, but small wins would be just having sensitizations, webinars such as this, and forums where you interact with healthcare providers so that they understand the importance of integrating the components of nurturing care into service delivery. Thank you. 
I love that. That's so practical and so pragmatic and feasible. Um, I see Dr. Bokar from Senegal. Do you have a question? Do you want to unmute yourself briefly? Just let us know, uh, you know, what you do and um, if you can ask a brief question. Yes, thank you so much. I will be very short from Senegal. I have a technical support of nurturing care. So the Senegal Minister of Health hired two people, two persons, to support the Minister of Health with the support of uh, UNICEF to support the Minister of Health to implement nurturing care. So I will be very brief. Uh, what we did is Senegal does not have much experience that uh, the people have, that have presented. We've just started the nurturing care in 2019. And due to COVID-19, people were not able to implement much activities. So this year, we did a situational analysis, and we showed that one of the main challenges we have is about integration. How to integrate five components, since we know that providers are already overwhelmed. In the health sector, they are overwhelmed. In the educational sector, they are overwhelmed. So how to get them to offer five components? So what we did is we tried to gather first. And also we know that uh, in every sector, nutrition, there are some people, some institutions that offer nutrition activities or the health activities or the education activities. So each component has some institutions that over, of, offer it. So what we did is we tried to gather them. We did some uh, workshops. We draw an operational guide. So that was the first step we did. We draw an operational guide. And in this guide, we had something we call operational sheets. So when you go to consultation, the provider should have one sheet in which you can find the older components and how to offer them together. So that was one of the main things I think to, I wanted mm. to share. Interesting. And we can, that's why we wanted to share with the Senegal experience. So integration is a really, really great challenge. And that's why we try to overcome it. But it's not already done, you know. It's something very new and we are trying to implement and maybe next time we will come and give the solutions and what we have good, what we have taken from. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I know we're right at time where we need to move on, but the, the richness of questions in the chat is enormous. And I'm wondering, Sheila, you know, it might be worthwhile for us to organize just the Q&A session, a technical chat um, with, with colleagues on that. So we'll, keep, we'll capture all the questions and we'll definitely keep them in mind. And thank you so much, Dr. Bukhar, for sharing the Senegal, um, you know, uh, experience. And it's clear that we're all grappling with this complex system that we're trying to do. But at the same time, I think the lesson here is that, you know, together incrementally, we can make progress. And Dr. Rajesh, I'm going to give you the last word before I hand over to Sheila to uh, share, um, to share uh, not, experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Shaikofe, not the last word, but my observation on this comment of the last speaker, that our workers are overwhelmed. You know, that's a very default response at many places and may not reflect the current reality in many situations. We have seen them struggling with regular work, but we have also seen that if you give them something which they find very pleased to do and enjoy, uh, even the hard-pressed uh, village level workers, health and nutrition extension workers, uh, start enjoying this uh, nurturing care work in their daily routines. Uh, it does demand a little bit more time, probably, uh, but also on this other side, the infections are going down in many countries in my region. Diarrhea is going down. There is a little bit of pneumonia, of course, is, is there, but uh, people are now in a position to actually offer a little bit more, and 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 the society is also demanding a little more. So I think we should motivate our people, uh, and they will be able to accommodate and enjoy the job. Thank you. Thank you for that. And with that, Sheila, over to you to share with us even more guidelines and resources that we have and um, we can all be using. So over to you, Sheila. Thanks, Rajesh and uh, Shakufe. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. I just wanted to pick up on your last point there, just to say, as you said, you know, it's not a one size fits all approach everywhere. And I think, Melanie, you alluded to that in the chat, as did Lana, that, you know, we need to look at where are the entry points in each of our contexts. You know? Part of it is what, where is the need? Where are the most vulnerable children in our context? What services are they accessing and how can we support them better? And then second is 
where are those easier entry points? Where is the low hanging fruit to use the phrase that Anna used earlier? Um, what are what can we do? It's not to say that we need to do everything right away. We start where we think there might be success. And Melanie, when you in the chat, you wrote, uh, we want to make sure that we don't treat it as something new or as something different or as something on the side, but rather something that is integral to the way that we support families in our services. Uh, and when we frame it that way, and when we look for opportunities to integrate into what we are already doing, we can troubleshoot those issues that often come up around um, time or other barriers. So before uh, we get to the closing, I'm just going to highlight a few things that are available and coming up for you to know about. Uh, one is just to recap the various resources. Today, we focused on two new resources, the Nurturing Care Handbook and the Nurturing Care Practice Guide, which, as you have all observed, have been developed with the health sector in mind, but not exclusively. They can and should be adapted and used by other sectors. So look for ways, look for what resonates for you and look for how to apply them. There was an earlier resource that was developed um, right after the framework, uh, which was called Operationalizing Nurturing Care for ECD Health Sector alongside other sectors. So right from the beginning with this idea and this understanding, as, as Rajesh said, for us to achieve what we want to achieve, we need to think multi-sectorally. Uh, there was a question in the comments about, uh, you know, do we have to have coordination? Uh, ultimately, we do need to work together. We need to find a way to work together. Uh, can we do things alone? Yes, there are some things that each sector and each constituency group can do alone, but we will do more if we can work together. So these resources are, are a point of reference for you. On the right-hand side of the screen are various thematic briefs that look at how we can think about nurturing care for different populations or different issues. So for example, men's engagement in nurturing care or nurturing care for children affected by HIV. These go into more practical solutions around policy and services, things that you can be thinking about. And then we just wanted to bring to your attention a few new resources that are in progress at the moment. Uh, this May will mark the five-year milestone for the Nurturing Care Framework. Uh, and so we are developing with UNICEF uh, and WHO together a progress report taking stock of what has happened around the world across the five strategic actions. Uh, what have we learned and what's the way forward? Uh, this will be uh, presented or this will be launched, sorry, in uh, May. So stay tuned for more information on that. And then as a continuation on the series of thematic briefs, there are two more that are in development, one around responsive feeding and the other around children with developmental delays and disabilities. So all of these will continue to be shared, um, especially if you're on the ECDAN mailing list, you will get notified as and when things are made available. Next slide. So those were all resources that come under the, the quote unquote nurturing care umbrella. But if we think more broadly, there are so many things that, that are available that are in our toolkit that we should be turning to. So here are a few new things that have come or are coming um, in the recent months. So um, strengthening implementation of home-based records for MNCH, um, guidelines on parenting interventions to prevent maltreatment and enhance parent-child relationships. The global scales for early development, looking at measurement at population levels for children uh, birth to three years of age. And then very soon, we will also have the caring for the caregiver package to support uh, more attention to how we look after caregivers in, in our context. So we will provide the links in the email that goes out afterwards. Uh, so you have access to these resources as well. Next slide. And the last is just to let you know about two events that are coming up uh, this month. Uh, next Thursday, the 6th of April, there will be another webinar focusing in on the practice guide. Uh, it is being hosted by the Health Systems for ECD Initiative for Europe and Central Asia. So it will have more of a focus on how the practice guide could be utilized by different uh, stakeholders in that region. And then on the 20th of April, the, the strengthening implementation of home-based records for MNCH, that practice, the practical guide will have its official launch on the 20th of April, and we'll include the links to register for these in the email uh, with the recording afterwards. So next slide, I think with that, we are getting ready for the closing, and I'd like to hand over to Anshu Banerjee, who's the Acting Interim Assistant Director General for the Division of Universal Health Coverage and Life Course, and also the Director for the Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child, and Adolescent Health and Aging. Over to you, Anshu. Thanks a lot, Sheila. And um, I would like to thank everyone for joining today, and in particular, I would like to thank 
the presenters and panelists for their contributions. Um, it's been a very rich and informative webinar, and we could see from all the questions that were uh, put forward, let's say, that uh, this really uh, struck uh, the right chord, let's say, with the audience. I think we all agree that early childhood development is everyone's business. Children are enabled to unlock their potential when they are supported from before birth by enabling environments that provide love, protection, nourishment, health, responsive caregiver, child interactions, and learning activities. It is important from a human capital development perspective, as well as from a human rights perspective, that every child should have the same opportunity to grow and develop. Within the global community, concerned with maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health, we have ample opportunities to contribute to this agenda. Every contact that a caregiver and a young child has with a healthcare provider is an opportunity to support early childhood and development. To summarize what we discussed, the practice guide helps planners and implementers to strengthen health and nutrition services. The handbook looks at the five strategic actions and provides guidance for activities that include, but are not limited to the health sector. As we are crossing the midway point towards the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals, and I must say we are at the midway point in a number of years, but definitely not in achieving the goals, uh, we all have an interest in joining hands and stepping up the effort. Recent results from population surveys conducted in Africa remind us that at least one in five children are not achieving their potential development. The evidence that underpins the nurturing care framework has shown us that it is feasible and affordable to change this stark reality and improve children's developmental outcomes. We can do so by working together so that every newborn can make the best start in life. Women, children and adolescents receive quality healthcare services and parents and other caregivers are supported in their capacity to provide nurturing care. I'd like to thank the ECD Action Network, the Quality of Care Network, and the Child Health Task Force for partnering with WHO and UNICEF in preparing this webinar and for reaching out to a wide community of stakeholders. When all of us are speaking with one voice and working together, we can make a difference. On behalf of UNICEF and WHO, I would like to thank all who attended this webinar once again for your interest and the Nurturing Care Progress Report from 2018 to 2023 that will be released on 24 May this year will provide further documentation of progress. We count on you and your commitment to use the new and available tools to make change happen. Thank you all once again and goodbye. Thank you.